Your call. You're in charge. Yeah, I think we're ready at this point. Just put that forward and back the remote. Back. There we go. Yeah, looks like we're good. Oh, I don't stick to my office. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, do you know anything? Oh, God. Probably it's time to get going. I know everybody's talking because of the snow, right? We all want to share oh, stories snow. about snow. <laughs> Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Kelsey Reeve today. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about the history of the hot springs. She's had a series of two, and I think probably today will be the third article in the paper, which is great to pull it together. And uh, every time I see the picture of when uh, Ray Scoglin had it and had the uh, swimming pool, I actually swam in it. Oh, no, I remember those days. So uh, Kelsey is the curator up at the um, museum up at the Heritage Park Museum, Heritage Park museum and uh, is working with the archives up there as well. So uh, she has the opportunity to be more knowledgeable than most of us. <laughs> Thanks for coming today, Kelsey. Thank you, Ed. Okay, so I have to stand in this square, so I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> um, standing in front of the in front of the presentation. So first of all, thank you guys. Thank it, thank you all for coming. Especially thank you to Marilyn Marilyn McLeod, who has actually provided the majority of the photos for the early part of the presentation, and that have been digitized and added the digital copies added to our collection. So I put John Stone. Um, I know you're a McLeod, but I just I just kept with your family name. Okay. <laughs> Um, so feel free, I know that we have lots of really knowledgeable people in the crowd today, so feel free to interrupt me if I say something not quite right or if you want to add your own memories. You're totally very welcome to do so. Okay, so I'm also sorry if I'm repeating some of the information if you've read the um, articles in the newspaper or checked out the exhibit online, so I may be a bit repetitive. I apologize about that. I've tried to keep to um, information that's additional rather than repetitive, but I may not do that perfectly. Okay. So today, the mineral pools at Mount Leighton Hot Springs Resort aren't open to the public. Um, the water slides sag further each year, and half the buildings on the property have sat vacant since a regional economic decline in the 1990s, plastic tacked along the framed windows in the illusion that the halting of construction was momentary. Their present state belies the central role that the hot springs played in the history and identity of the Northwest region of British Columbia. So this image is actually of the hot springs prior to any development, so in 1907. So this is the main pool, um, which you can still see from the highway uh, as you drive by. It's now in encased in concrete. Um, there's a woman here. I don't know who that woman is. Do you, Marilyn? No, okay. Um, so the hot springs have been the subject of a series of commercial developments since 1910, from a log cabin bathhouse to a multi-million dollar development replete with water slides and several restaurants. Long frequented by the local Simshian people, the clay and warm mineral waters at the hot springs were traditionally used for healing. Um, so Bruce Johnstone, Marilyn's grandfather, preempted the hot springs by 1906 in the early 1900s. The preemption system was kind of a homesteading system where you could claim 160 acres of rural or northern land. Um, and if you developed it by about 2% per year, eventually you could purchase it for a nominal fee. So Marilyn's grandfather um, preempted the hot springs. He knew about the hot springs land because of his um, work with fisheries, with a fish hatchery nearby. Um, he developed a rustic spa, which I'm going to talk about a little more. Um, and he operated that from 1910 until 1936. The hot springs sat dormant from 1936 to 1958 when they were purchased by Ray Scoglin, who several of you have already told me you remember the Scoglin version of the hot springs. Um, so Ray Scoglin operated the hot springs from 1958 to 1978 when they again sat dormant um, and went into receivership and were owned by the provincial government. Um, so in the early 1980s, the provincial government began doing studies and also putting the hot springs out for tender. They ended up receiving five different bids um, on the hot springs property and they chose Bert Orleans, who is the current owner, um, and he had very grandiose plans for the hot springs. He developed, um, he developed a large complex, a large resort um, on the property and ran that for several years. Um, 
he put quite a bit of money into them. Um, there was a. Sorry, the camera got moved. Go ahead. Okay. There was a regional economic decline in the 1990s, and he um, stopped putting money into them, resulting in what they are today, um, which is that they are not open to the public, and people lament about the state of the the current state of the hot springs. So that's the general overview. So I'll show you some photos from the hot springs throughout its various um, phases of development. Um, I think it's important to note that the hot springs has been always frequented by Northwest residents um, as a site of recreation and leisure. So it's rem remembered really fondly by a lot of people, um, whether they went to Bruce Johnstone's resort, Ray Scoglin's resort, Bert Orleans resort, or, or even just climbed, uh, hiked in, and bathed in the mud pools in between those eras. Um, so people have really fond memories. They used to go there for fun and recreation. Um, so almost anybody that I talk to can tell me a, a wonderful story. I was at the ski hill this weekend and a lady came up to me and told me about having her 13th birthday at the Scogland Hot Springs. Um, and she, she was telling me all these wonderful things. And then another person behind us in line heard, overheard us and told, told us that uh, he got kicked out by Ray Scogland for jumping off the roof into the pools. So everybody has really wonderful memories. Um, and the reason I've been interested in the Hot Springs is because I used to come stay with my grandparents at Lake House Lake and I would go with my sisters and cousins to the hot springs and go swimming and it was actually my first job when I was 15 years old so I worked at the front desk there. Um, so I've always been interested in it. When I came to work at Heritage Park I started looking through our oral histories and found that people held very similar memories. So people who were interviewed in the 1970s, so old timers that had grown up in the early part of the 20th century, were telling, were telling very similar, similar stories that I felt I had. So I feel like it's a site of community memory. When a community memory grant came out by the federal government, I applied for it to, um, to digitize some of the photos and collect some of the stories that people love to tell about the hot springs. And Marilyn McLeod was really instrumental in helping with that. Um, okay, so Phil Burton, who's not here today, actually asked me to talk about the science and geology of the hot springs, which I'm really not great at, so luckily we have Norma in the audience. Um, my friend Travis Murphy, who's a geologist, actually prepared me five special slides that like tell you about the geology, because I was so nervous about this part. Um, but this is a, a chemical sample from 1950 that shows the chemical mix makeup of the hot springs water. It's actually the most complete sample that's on public record. Um, there have been other surveys, but this is the most complete, so I chose to use that one. And future surveys indicate that not that much has changed. So, Excuse I me, Kelsey, is that on the web page on your memory? Yes, yeah, okay. I believe so. If it's not, I can email it to you. I'm okay. pretty sure it's on the website on the Community Memories exhibit. Um, so depending on your delineations, what you decide is a hot spring and what you decide makes up the area of the Lake House Hot Springs, there are approximately 13 hot springs of various sizes to the east of Lake House Lake. And they've traditionally been named for, um, for Lake House Lake. They've traditionally been called, been called Lake House Hot Springs, although Scogland operated a resort known both as Scogland Hot Springs and Lake House Hot Springs, and Burt Orleans ended up operating a resort called Mount Layton Hot Springs, which I'll explain later. So Lake House itself is an endless anglicization of Lac Yells, probably pronounced that very poorly and I apologize, which is the Somalia word for the site of freshwater mussels. The temperature of the main hot spring, which you can see from the highway, the large concrete thing letting off steam, ranges between 56 and 80 degrees Celsius, with outlying reports of 86 degrees Celsius temperatures sampled at the center of the 30 meter diameter pool. The main spring's total output seems to vary seasonally and year to year, ranging from a low of 489 liters per day to a high of 772 liters per day. So it's a lot of water, it's a very large spring, and that's only the main spring. So remember there's at least 13 others and probably a lot more as Marilyn can probably attest to. The mineral content of the main hot spring was sampled in 1950 as follows. So in parts per million, it has 46.6 um, calcium, um, 0.5 magnesium, 320 parts sodium. So you can read all of these. Um, interestingly, it's not very, or it's fairly high in lithium for a hot spring and not very high in sulfur compared to other hot springs. Um, when, when it was sampled in 1950 in this, in this sample, there didn't appear to be a significant amount of lithium in the hot springs, 
but the Geological Survey of Canada has sampled again several times and has consistently found high, high lithium contents. Um, so, but lithium looks like approximately 10.2 parts per million over the years, which is fairly high for hot springs. And throughout its operation, every owner has trumpeted lithium as being responsible for the miraculous cures that have been recorded at, at the Lake House Hot Springs. So people who have come in on stretchers um, with, with crippling arthritis and all sorts of different disorders say that they are cured by the hot springs. And that is possibly due to the lithium. The hot springs water is potable and large, widely lauded, lauded as odorless due to the lack of the relative lack of sulfur. Um, the smaller hot springs clustering around the large main pool warm wetlands across the highway from the main spring. And right now, um, somebody has dug out. Actually, um, Marilyn's family, some descendants of the original operator, have dug out um, hot springs across the highway from from the resort. Um, and you can go in and, and soak in, in the mud there. They, you kind of have to plug them up and they're very muddy and they vary, they vary seasonally also, but, but it's kind of neat that you still can access something. Um, because lake residents tell of observing soft spots on the lake ice, um, notably your father, Marilyn, he said that several times in the newspaper, <coughs> there may also be springs directly beneath Lake House Lake. And this is Travis's statement, so any errors are my own. Um, unlike the upwelling plume of Yellowstone, for example, these hot springs are fault-driven. Fault lines along the boundaries of the kitsum kitimat Valley act as water conduits, heating the water through exposure to gases from the Earth's core. So Travis prepared me these slides and said, um, there's nothing really out there publicly that shows the geological properties of the hot springs, so he made these for me. Um, so this shows the general area and then where the hot springs are. And then it shows the fault lines coming down. Um, and this is the hot springs. Um, and then this is a geological map showing all the different, um, all the different faults meeting. And I'm sorry if you have questions about it. I cannot answer them, but I can email Travis and then answer you later. Um, so, so he told me to note the confluence of the multiple faults in the area and said that that likely plays a key role in the development of the hot springs. Um, so then this is just a Google map version that shows you where the hot springs are again. And the faults. And this is um, a, a diagram from the BC Geological Survey um, PDF, which is available online. Any of you guys can, can look that up. Um, and it's a fairly good diagram that shows you how the hot springs themselves are formed. But Travis referred to it as the plumbing system that feeds the hot springs. <laughs> Do you want to add anything to that, Norma? <coughs> when we talked to Geological Survey of Canada in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and they were looking at geothermal heat sources um, surrounding the hot springs, that was their interpretation that was fault driven. Mm -hmm. It's a very much a point source rather than a wide spectrum source for the, high, for the hot water there. Right. So not necessarily if you drilled at the airport would you get geothermal heat. It's, it's exceptional to that area, or unique to that because area. Because of the intersection of the faults, so that, that agrees with that. Okay, thanks. Um, and hi, Gordon, another geologist here to, <laughs> to understand more. Okay, so those are the slides that I was requested to do. Um, so now back to the main stories of the hot springs. Um, so the Lake Hills hot springs have always been a site of community, as I noted earlier. There are lots of stories from local people um, about using the hot springs to cure ailments and things like that. This is a photo of Bruce Johnstone's log cabin lodge at the hot spring, the main, near, close to the main hot spring in 1922. And you can see the large fishing rod. So Johnstone was marketing, thanks Gordon, okay. So Johnstone was marketing um, the hot springs as a site to uh, have or to do spectacular fly fishing as well as to soak in the hot springs water. And you can see some of the guests that, that were visiting. And this photo is again from the Johnstone collection. Um, Addie Turner, who was from Kitsum Kalem, was interviewed in 2004 
and referred to the hot springs as a kind of native hospital. Um, Abby remembered going to the hot springs with her grandparents, Emma and Charles Nelson, who originally helped George Little, who later became the preemptor of the Terrace Town site in the early 1900s. Um, and there are more stories about um, Kitsilis in particular using the hot springs. Um, there were some oral, oral interviews done with Kitsilis elders, but I wasn't able to include those in the exhibit, but those are available and tell a wonderful story that I'd like to follow up on more in the future. Um, so, as I noted, Bruce preempted the hot springs by 1906. He, um, a partner bought into his preemption, um, a partner, Hank Boss, who was a telegraph operator at Kitsilis in the early 1900s, and he purchased half of Johnstone's preemption for about $175. Um, so he was, he was Johnstone's partner for some time. Um, he eventually died early, and he only ever seemed to be a silent pot partner. He didn't have that much to do in the day-to-day -day operation of the hot springs. Um, Johnstone began clearing land shortly after preemption, with the ex expectation that Kitimat would be chosen as the terminus of the of the railway. Um, in 1910, Johnstone built a roadhouse next to the hot springs, which is pictured here, to house the anticipated hordes of railway traffic. Um, when the railway was routed to Prince Rupert, instead, Johnstone continued undeterred, if disappointed. So this is another image um, of the hot spring, the original lodge at the hot springs. And this shows Bruce, Johnstone, um, it says third from left, but that looks like a woman. Um, hopefully, they, hopefully I've just got it backwards. And um, this is Bruce Johnstone and this is Beatrice, can you? Yeah, okay, perfect. So this is Bruce Johnstone and his wife Beatrice in front of the Hot Springs Hotel. Um, and this picture was undated, but the hotel was built in 1910, so sometime probably shortly after that. Um, Bruce met Beatrice Bradley during a winter furlough in Victoria in 1912. Her brother-in-law was the head of BC Fisheries, and they were married in 1913. At that point, Johnstone arranged to sell the Hot Springs property and bought a home in Victoria. The sale of the property fell through and the newlyweds returned to Lake Hells Lake in 1915. Lloyd Johnstone, um, who later became the mayor of Terrace and who grew up at the Hot Springs, who was the son of um, Bruce and Beatrice, mused that it must have been a very lonely life for his mother. Um, Beatrice was well educated and hailed from a large lumber family in Ottawa. As a newlywed, she moved to Lake Hells Lake and then was quickly immersed in rural pioneer life. During the summer seasons, she would wake up at 4 o'clock a.m. to bake pies, wash clothes by hand, and cook for between 12 and 20 guests. There were very few permanent residents at Lake House Lake at that point, um, or none, I guess, um, just seasonal people otherwise. Um, so she had, she had few people to talk to other than guests and, and was living this very rural life. She occasionally had a part-time cook and waitress to assist her. But nonetheless, it must have been an extreme adjustment from city life in Eastern Canada. You can see the stumps surrounding the hotel. So this is a photo of Lloyd, Marilyn's father, who later became the mayor of Terrace. And I actually put it up to show you guys the V-shaped troughs that carried water um, from the hot spring itself, the main hot spring, to the lodge that we saw in the previous slide. Or to a bathhouse beside the lodge, I guess, sorry. Um, so the, the V-shaped trough was just two pieces of lumber nailed together and totally open. The hot springs came out at such a high temperature that they didn't need to insulate the water. Um, and it was carried about 1,200 feet from the main hot spring into the bathhouse. And it, the water was transported to wooden tubs um, through, through this. Through this. Um, Interestingly, the Johnstone family kept about 15 cows at the hot springs, one of which is pictured here, as well as a, veg as a vegetable garden to feed themselves and the guests at the lodge. Probably another chore for Beatrice to do, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, apparently, their garden was much more productive than terrace settlers due to the minerals in the hot springs water. Today, Bert Orleans pipes the hot springs water into greenhouses, continuing to use the mineral water to grow <coughs> enormous organic vegetables. And as a side note, Lloyd actually served as the mayor of Terrace from 1972 to 1974. When he moved outside municipal boundaries to Lake House Lake, he chose not to run for a second term as mayor. His replacement, Gordon Rowland, noted that he was a tough act to follow. He said, now I know how the rookie ball player replacing Babe Ruth must have felt. 
in his inaugural, inaugural address. Um, so this is Bruce, and this is a cedar plank walkway. So when guests arrived to, um, to stay at the Hot Springs Lodge, they would have to um, be take the train to Terrace, be driven from the train out to Lake House Lake, and the very first car in Terrace was a Stanley steamer, bought precisely for this purchase or purpose, but it couldn't keep up with the hills, um, the steepness of the hills, so it's promptly returned. Um, and the guests would get out to the lake. Um, there was a single wire phone system where they would pick up the phone, it would call Bruce at, at, at the lodge, and he would um, row, out, row across the lake and pick them up and then bring them back here. They would get to the Cedar Plank walkway and have to cart their luggage um, about 5,000 feet on the split cedar plank walkway. So this is an image of the cedar plank walkway with Bruce with a wheelbarrow. So maybe he carried some of the luggage. Uh, we do have at least one story of people carrying their own luggage, and I do know that Lloyd, his son, often carried bags too. Um, oh, and this is an image of an advertisement advertising the Lake Hills Hot Springs in the Terrace newspaper at the time. So it shows that it was $2.50 a day. Um, and gives the temperature of the springs, which is a bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> um, and says that it's the finest health and pleasure resort in the north. Oh, and this image is from 1920, and again from the Johnston collection. Kelsey, where did the road go to? Where did he have the road to? Um, Marilyn, do you know what this went to the, oh, what you call the picnic site. Oh, okay. To the picnic site, Gordon. So the question was, where did the road go to? And it went to the picnic site. Um, and the road. So a very, very tough life. And they did a lot in order to run, operate the lodge. In the spring of 1929, Bruce Johnstone decided that the future of tourism was at, on lake shores itself. So he decided that the rustic bathhouse had served well, for 19 years, but that he needed to build something more picturesque on the lake shore, so that guests would come for the uh, would come to appreciate the views as well as um, the healing properties of the hot springs water. So, in 1929, he built this lake shore lodge, um, and it was built using vertical log construction. It's quite beautiful. Um, it was about 70 by 40 feet and had 12 upstairs bedrooms. Downstairs was a large stone fireplace, a dining room, living room, and a few extra bedrooms. It, there was a bathhouse that was about the same size as the lodge, but that was constructed of horizontal logs. And that featured a large fireplace and four to six, seven foot enamel bathtubs. So this is another image of the lodge completed. This is sometime in the 1930s. You can see the stone fireplace and um, the shakes and how large the building was. And this is a photo showing the lodge right on the lake shore. This would have been taken from the lake. Um, so Frank Poe, um, who is a wealthy Illinois contractor who retired to Lake House Lake, um, decided that um, Bruce should have the water coming right down to, to the lake shore as well as the hotel. Um, so he, he financed um, Bruce to construct a, a wooden pipe from the hot springs itself down to the lake, which was about 5,000 feet, um, approximately 5,000 feet. And <coughs> it was sort of, it was sort of alone. Um, it, there wasn't that much expectation of repayment. Poe was fairly wealthy. Um, and he, he just told Bruce that that's, this was the way to go. So Bruce um, installed an uninsulated wire bound wooden pipeline that carried the hot springs water um, for the first 1,000 feet, the pipe was 8 inches in di diameter, and for the final 4,000 feet, the pipe was 6 inches in diameter. Sorry, It was entirely gravity-fed. By the time the water arrived at the bathhouse, it had cooled to a perfect temperature for soaking. And we actually received some sections of this pipe from the Kitimat Museum and Archives recently, so we do have sections of the pipe in our collection, which is pretty neat. Kelsey, yes. can you tell me where the location of that uh, lodge is on the lake? Marilyn, I, the notes from your dad were at Oli's place, yes, right? Is it where Oli's place was, as we know Oli's place? Yeah. All right. And the, the first lodge was up at the hot, near the hot springs itself, the main pool. Um, in 1936, the Skeena River flooded, halting passenger trains from the end of May through late August. 
This destroyed Johnstone's entire tourist season. Incidentally, Frank Poe, the Chicago invest or Illinois investor, had died the year before, and his estranged wife and daughter arrived in 1936 to settle his estate. Lloyd estimated Poe's investment in the pipeline at between $6,000 and $8,000. In 1936, at the height of the Depression, Johnstone was unable to settle the outstanding debt, especially because he had no income coming in for much of the 1936 season, the majority of the 1936 season. Um, the widow and daughter were apparently completely uninterested in um, the operation, and they insisted that Johnstone repay them. So at as a result, Johnson was forced into foreclosure and lost the Lake Hills Hot Springs property over the pipe that I've been telling you about. And Lloyd remembered that at that point, he was a very bitter man. He'd worked for, for three decades um, establishing this and then lost it for a small loan. So this is an image um, of Marilyn's mom and aunt, right? Okay, <laughs> so they're, they're doing mud masks at the Hot Springs. And I just put it up because I had this great quote from Elsie Molitor Froze that she, re she recalled in the Terrace Historical Society's 20th Century Anecdotes. Um, she said that in the in-between period, so after Johnstone had lost the property and while it was sitting there, which this, this would have been a bit before, before then, but I thought the image itself was interesting. In the in-between period, Elsie recalls that we used to row over to the south end and hike a muddy trail into the hot springs. At that time, it was only the spring where the hot springs boiled out and a few muddy holes where people had dug nearby. We soaked in there for a while, putting mud packs on our faces to preserve our youth, and hiked back out to our boat for home. Often there were strangers from Rupert hiking in, and they looked at us very strangely with our faces covered with dry mud. Like that photo. Um, and this is an image of one of the cabins that had been at the, ho at the hot springs property prior to being moved, and then now the cabin is actually at Heritage Park Museum and has been preserved um, to tell people about the logging history of the area as well as the hot springs history in the region. So this is an image of Krista, um, who is the great-granddaughter of Bruce Johnstone, standing in the doorway of the Johnstone cabin. That was in 2012. So following the period that the hot springs sat dormant, um, Lloyd, Bruce's son, actually bought the Hot Springs property back. Hello. More as he didn't really intend to develop it, but he bought it back to, and his father at that point was very happy, so he bought it back into the family. Um, and then it just sat there. He, he was the mayor of Terrace, as I've noted, and also running a business. Um, and he didn't, he noted that he never really intended to, to develop it. So Ray Scogland bought the property from L Lloyd Johnstone in 1958, and this is an image of Ray Scogland. Um, Ray was a logging contractor from the Terrace area who had very grandiose plans about what to do with the Lake House Hot Springs property. Sorry, that was too early, but it's a great photo. <laughs> um, his daughter, Alice Gallner, provided this photo as well as several others. Um, and she noted in his obituary that his personable manner and charismatic personality enabled him to be a great promoter of the resort as well as the whole Northwest. Wherever he went, he spread the news about the hot springs. His son, David, has a story of a trip across Canada on which Ray brought several hundred bumper stickers from the hot springs. David's job was to attach them to as many billboards and poles as possible. Years later, people would come in telling the story of having seen one of these bumper stickers on their travels. So that's Ray. So Ray built, first of all, an outdoor swimming pool that he just intended to use seasonally. Um, that was in his first phase of development. Um, he, when he was writing a promotional article about the hot springs in the Northwest Digest, he noted that when snow fell last winter, so he's referring to the winter of 1958, the first winter, that the hot springs was, was operational. When snow fell last winter, I fully expected that the season had ended, but here again I was wrong. The cold weather didn't discourage the people of Terrace, Kitimat, and surrounding areas. Many Sundays we had over 100 people in the pools and they invented a game. After soaking in the water that is almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit, they would jump out and throw themselves into fluffy snow. <coughs> I used to shiver just watching them. So as a result, he um, ended up building an enclosed pool 
that, uh, that less brave people could soak in through the winters, but also left one of the pools outdoors so that people could continue doing this. So Ray built several pools, um, many different hotel rooms. He had tents um, that would be cheaper for families from the area to come to. He was very clear throughout about making sure that the resort was a place that Northwest residents would always be welcome at. So this is an image of the outdoor pool in the late 50s, early 60s. You can check out the cars and the diving boards and you probably remember that. <laughs> And another, another aerial image of showing the breadth of the operation. And this is the main, is the, um, main hot springs pool that is still there today. Pretty? Wasn't there a dance part to the, that maybe the next phase? Yeah. He used to go out there and go dancing. Oh, cool. Yeah. He had like, this one? Yeah, that's that's was a dance. That was the dance oh, place. Cool. And it was like a ballroom as well as a dining room, right, yeah. Diana? Yeah, yeah. okay. True. Though we have some photos of inside the dining room, but not of the dance scene, so that's great to know that. So Kelsey, the main hot springs with water, hot water is bubbling up, is that in the picture? Yeah, I think that's the one on the far. The round one? Yeah. Can anybody chime in and confirm? I just guessed that, but yeah. Okay. And there were um, longer term cabins for people to stay in. And you can see an RV here. People started bringing RVs and there was an RV park. He built tents for families to stay in who couldn't necessarily afford the hotel rooms in the main part. So he was very visionary and had large plans. He had a three phase plan of development. Um, this is of the second phase of development, which was the main one that ended up being realized. And there's an image of the pool that he enclosed with plastic um, after, after the first winter when he realized there was still a market for people to come over the winter. Um, and Maggie Baxter, one of our board members, told me a story about that um, snakes used to hide in the wall here because of the warmth. <laughs> There's um, a photo of a diver jumping into the pools. When, I, when this was in the newspaper, I'm pretty sure some people didn't read the article and actually thought it was like a proposal of what would happen at the hot springs. And we're like, oh, that looks so good. Can't wait for it to happen. But this, of course, was in the 50s or 60s. We were all waiting. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an image of what Ray Skogelin called Skogie Ski Hill, or what was affectionately called Skogie Ski Hill. Um, it was open in January of 1966. Um, and he installed, uh, there was a 380, 380 vertical feet that was serviced by a seven tower T-bar. Um, there was a 1500 foot ski run that had a slalom run, sizable jumps, as well as a mercury va vapor floodlight system for night skiing. <coughs> um, on the very first date that the hill was open, there were over Sorry. There were over a thousand people that attended a ski meet at Skogie Ski Hill. Skiers, oh that may have been the second day that it was open, sorry, but skiers from across the region competed in the ladies junior and senior events and men's juvenile junior and senior events. Skogland himself had, presented, had intended to present the very first Skogie Ski Hill Cup, but he broke his ankle early in the day while being towed behind a snowmobile. So, and several people have told me that it was a very icy ski hill, so I guess it must have been a bit dangerous. So this was just across the highway from the hot springs. Um, and Skoglin envisioned a situation where you would ski down and then cross the highway and soak. So it was a remarkably unique situation. Um, the proximity of the ski hill was unlike any, the proximity of the ski hill to the hot springs was unlike any other. Um, hot springs in Canada at the time. Um, eventually, Skoglin planned to resort, the, planned to expand the resort's service area to 4,000 feet, um, to double the T-bar, um, and install a bunny tow for children. That, much like many of the plans for the hot springs, never actually was realized. Um, and that was relegated again to the fond mythology that with which people in Terrace speak about the hot springs. Um, an inland canal was dug using some of the heavy duty machinery Scotland had from his logging operation um, from Lake House Lake up to the hot springs. It was 50 feet in width and 2400 feet in length um, and people were invited to boat up the canal. And I believe an earlier version was bug dug by your father, right Marilyn? 
or no? Okay, this was the first one. Okay, I had heard a rumor about that and wasn't sure. So this, I guess, was the first canal. Um, so Scoglin wanted people from the area to just boat from the lake right up to the hot springs and be able to come for a hamburger in the restaurant. There was a boat launching ramp situated within a thousand feet of the main building at the hot springs, and Scoglin kept some horses on the property that people could use for, could rent for trail rides. We also have some photos of people kayaking through the canal. He kept kayaks as well and rented them out. So he had a very large reaching plans for the hot springs. This is another image of the outdoor swimming pool. Really like the bathing suits that you can see. Um, in 1959, Scoglin continued to expand the hot springs into a resort. With much fanfare, he opened a $125,000 extension in the autumn of 1959. A second, slightly cooler outdoor pool measuring 30.5 by 15 meters featured underwater lighti lighting, two diving boards, and a windbreak. Change rooms had a capacity of four, for 400 guests and were flanked by a steam room as well as Roman baths for guests with health issues. Um, there were 24 cozy tents that I've already mentioned, complete with a stove, table, and chairs to provide lower budget accommodations. Um, Scoglin renovated an earlier building into a lounge and a coffee bar. And then there was a canal and horse rides that I already mentioned. So this is a letter um, from Buckingham Palace to Ray Scoglin. He uh, apparently was so, so keen in his in his at marketing efforts that he wrote to the wrote to the queen and asked her to visit asked her to visit um, Lake House Hot Springs and then the palace wrote back. And this is a, f a pillow um, that would have been in one of the hotel rooms at Scogland Hot Springs. Um, and it was actually donated by Bob Erb before he became a millionaire <laughs> um, by Bob Erb um, to the to Heritage Park Museum. So we have this in our permanent collection. Um, and Scoglin <coughs> noted that people, many people in the area were afraid that the tents were too cozy and that they would spoil people. Um, he really, throughout though, wanted family to use the hot springs wanted, and wanted local people to not to be priced out of using the hot springs, which has been a concern throughout the history of the hot springs. Kelsey, excuse me, was that logo used on postcards? Yeah, yeah, we have we have some plates also of the logo. I'm not sure who designed it, and I'd actually like to find that out because it, yeah, it doesn't look shim sham at all. No, it really it? doesn't. I'm not I'm not sure what it is. <coughs> so you don't know who did the design? No, but I'd like to know. So if anybody ever finds that out, let me know. <laughs> um, Bob actually got, just got this at a garage sale. I can't remember if this one was in Kamloops or Kelowna, but he he was garage sailing around the province and found three different items of Scoglin Hot Springs memorabilia and brought them in to us a couple years ago, which was wonderful. Um, so this is a sort of pixely photo, I'm sorry about that, but it shows Bert Orleans, Ray Scoglin, and Lloyd, Lloyd Johnstone at the Hot Springs during um, Bert Orleans' tenure. So Ray Scoglin's final am ambitions for the Scoglin Hot Springs Resort ranged from arcades and more camping sites to an 1800 foot landing strip so that planes could land within the confines of the resort. Eventually, the complex would envelope guests who would not need to leave for anything. Phase three would see the expansion of the total room count to 500. A beauty parlor, physiotherapy rooms, an expanded ski hill, a 40-acre golf course, and a new Olympic-sized outside swimming pool for summer were other items on Scoglin's agenda. According to the local newspapers, Scoglin was even considering installing a drive-in movie theater that could be viewed from the interior and exterior of the complex. Scoglin's visionary transformation of the Lake Hills Hot Springs into a glamorous, self-contained international attraction was never finalized. Before phase three began, Scoglin's financial backers balked, balked, balked and his overall vision was sidelined. Um, so Scoglin was the sole operator of the resort into the later 1960s, when he sold interests in the company to finance the enormity of his vision. Um, following a fire in November 1966 that destroyed three of the duplex cabins, the holding company who owned much of the property um, refused to support further expansion. Beginning in the early 1970s, the property changed hands several times and the hot springs fell apart without the guiding force of Scoglin's enthusiasm, hard work and determination. He slowly disengaged himself and in 1978 a flood completed the long decline. 
the resort was closed to the public. In the following year, the property was turned over to the provincial government by the Canadian American Loan and Investment Corporation, and the property was dormant once again. Um, so this image is of the three, the three main owners of the Hot Springs property. Um, Bert, Bert Orleans, who's pictured on the left here, purchased the Hot Springs property from the provincial government in 1985. I noted at the beginning that Orleans had operated a tug, or sorry, had been the highest, had been chosen as the <coughs> successful bidder out of five bidders. Um, Orleans owned and operated a tugboat company out of Kitimat and Prince Stupert. By 1985, the Lake House Hot Springs had been closed to the public for seven years, and there was much anxiety about reopening the resource to the region. Orleans was chosen at, by the provincial government as the person they selected as being most qualified and committed to carry out the project. So this is an image from opening day in, uh, in 1988. And it shows um, Justine Ewart and Carrie McLeod, who were, Ewart is the granddaughter of Ray Scogland, who, and um, McLeod is great granddaughter of Bruce Johnstone and also Marilyn's daughter. So it's great granddaughter, right, Marilyn? She'd be great granddaughter of Bruce? You. Okay, yeah. So I just thought it was kind of cool that they were included in the opening ceremonies. And this was published in the Terrace Review at the newspaper at the time. Um, Orleans began his tenure at the Hot Springs with a sense of grandioseness, much like Scogland had decades before. He intended to create a playground for the elite, complete with a golf course, a therapeutic clinic, and a helicopter on standby to take guests heli skiing. He planned to build a resort hotel centered around the main Hot Springs pool, which we've seen from time to time, which would be enclosed in a dome of glass and surrounded by a tropical garden. You'll be able to go from the dead of winter to the tropics just by walking in the door, he told the Terrace Chamber of Commerce in 1987. Um, in the first phase of development, Orleans built a warm swimming pool with a diving area, a large hot tub, three water slides, two children's water slides, and a children's swimming pool, complete with a UFO style children's water park from Expo 86. Um, the pools were treated with an ozone water treatment system imported from Germany. There was a restaurant, a Johnstone dining room, rooftop gardens, a splashdown lounge. Um, and I'm sure all of you guys were familiar with what the hot springs look like at this point. Um, Orleans chose the name Mount Leighton Hot Springs Resort when he was unable to register the name Lake House Hot Springs Resort. A competing bidder for the hot springs actually registered the original name. So rather than purchase it from him, Bert decided to name the hot springs after a mountain across Highway 37 and to the east of the hot springs. The mountain itself was named for R.B. Layton, who had lived in a cabin at its foot. He was a homesteader or preemptor, much like Johnstone had been of the Hot Springs. Um, he came to the area in 1910 and preempted that section of land. He went overseas during World War I and returned and took a correspondence course to become an architect and went to New York City. So he doesn't have a long tenure in the Terrace area, um, but that is the reason that they, the Hot Springs are called Lake or Mount Layton Hot Springs rather than Lake House Hot Springs. So this is an image of the, comp the roof in one of the uncompleted buildings <coughs> at the Hot Springs. It's a beautiful cedar roof. Um, Orleans poured foundations for a second phase hotel complex in the early 1990s after this initial development, um, but cautioned that he was closely monitoring economic and tourism trends. When indicators say the project is a go, the Terrace Review quoted Orleans in 1991, Everything will be in place and the buildings will go up relatively quickly. By 1991, Orleans stated that he had spent $5 million developing the Lake House Hot Springs into Mount Layton Hot Springs Resort. He planned to spend another $10 million over the next 10 years. Um, a regional economic downturn occur coincided with his plans for a second phase. Um, he continued to operate the swimming pools in the hotel rooms constructed in his first phase but stalled the second phase indefinitely. So this is what the hot springs looked like in 2009, even 
even worse today. So this is where the roof that I just showed you is in an unfinished convention center that was planned to be for phase two. There's the UFO H2O from Expo 86. And the UFO actually only was operational for a few years. I guess it had a very complex piping system that was like cutting edge for Expo 86. And the hot springs water had so many minerals that they very quickly plugged up those pipes and then it just kind of sat there for quite some time. Elsewhere on the property, there are greenhouses where Orleans grows hibiscus, his flowers and vegetables nourished by the minerals and warmth of the hot springs water, grow large and bountifully, much as they were said to in the meadow near the Johnstone's original lodge. Um, so I'll do that one. Today, people constantly muse about the vast potential of the Lake Hills hot springs. In letters to the editor, in municipal and regional government discussions, and in public and online forums, Residents of Northwestern British Columbia expressed disgust, anger, and concern that what they feel should be a world-class resort has been squandered. Since the late 1970s, the Lake Hills Hot Springs have been a recurring election issue. Actually, Iona Campanola had one of her campaign platforms was that she would ensure that the Hot Springs um, were brought back to their former glory, and she was not elected um, in 1979 when that was her campaign. The hotel rooms, lounge, and cafeteria do remain open to the public, but the mineral waters that drew the young and old to soak or race up the many stairs to the water slides are barred to the public. Much as was feared would come to pass in the interim period between Scoglin's Lake House Hot Springs Resort and Orleans Mount Lake and Hot Springs Resort. So at the base of the water slides in the splashdown pool, you can actually soak in the hot springs water if you've paid for a hotel room or a staff of M Mount Lake and Hot Springs Resort. <coughs> So they're still not open to the public, but if you are dedicated enough and want to pay a hundred or so dollars for a hotel room, you can, you can go soak in them. So I, I have to express that caveat. Um, the history of Lake House Hot Springs encompasses Bruce Johnstone's log cabin spa, Ray Scoglin's not quite fulfilled ambitions, and Burt Orleans' half-built water wonderland. Perhaps, given that millions of dollars, decades, and dreams have failed to attract the international intention long anticipated, the Lake Hills Hot Springs are simply not well positioned to support large-scale development. I don't know if that's true or not, but that keeps recurring in every phase, so that may be, that may be one of the reasons that they never realized their international gl glamour. Um, yeah, so thank you all for coming. Does any, oh, I have one more slide. So this is, this shows um, my family history at the Hot Springs, so this is my older sister, Jennifer. Um, with my great grandparents, Eric and Elisa Christensen, and some family friends at the Hot Springs in the late 90s. Hot Springs in the late 1990s. I found that when I was going through family albums, so I thought I'd put it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, thank you, guys. If, if you have any questions, um, it's being webcast, and we would ask if you could. Uh, you can ask the question up there, otherwise, Kelsey will have to repeat I'll repeat questions. it back if you don't want to come up here. <laughs> and I'm also sorry I went so long. I tend to get very, I tend to talk too long about the hot springs. <laughs> Kelsey, there is a dam attached to the hot springs. What, what did you find out about that? I didn't find anything. Okay. I, may, I may have some in my files. Like I did the research for this project a couple of years ago when we did the community memories exhibit. So I'll go back to the office and look through my files and see if I can find anything. There were a lot of very technical things about the Lake Hills Hot Springs during Bird Orleans, like different plans for development. So it may be in there. Where is the dam? Did you see a dam? Yes. yes. It's up on the mountain yeah, right behind. No, I've seen the pictures of what they were building. It, but cool. that was Raymond who did that. Cool. He yeah, started it. Yeah. So for, sorry, I was supposed to repeat that question. The question was about a dam that is attached to the hot springs. And apparently it was built by Ray Scoglin. OK. So that's on one one. It's in, I don't know where it is, I've just seen pictures oh. of It's in my the bush off to the north ago. of the hot springs. Yeah, and it's up top. It's up, up on a, it's not that far in from the road actually, but mm. it's there. Cool. I think I might have some slides. Sure, I would love to see those. <laughs> yep. There was a rumor that after the earthquake on Haddock Wag uh, a year or so ago that um, new hot springs sources were sort of noted in the lake. Has there been changes to the temperature or the hot springs oh, okay. themselves over the years? Um, I don't think they've been professionally sampled over the last at least decade, um, though I could be wrong about that. Um, because they are private, they 
um, would only be sampled by the owners, I believe. Um, but that would be something interesting to look into for sure. Sorry, the question was whether after the earthquake um, there were any changes to the temperature in the Lake House Hot Springs pools. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. Anyone else? Judy? The uh, mud. I, when I used to swim at the hot spring, we never went over and did the mud bathing then. Mm -hmm. But I bumped into people at the city pool that have gone through and put the mud bath on. Cool. Has, did anybody ever pack, like, did Ray ever think about packaging it up for a mud bath, like they do in spas and other parts? Of You'd them? almost think he would have, hey? Yeah. Sorry, the question was whether anybody ever commercialized the, <coughs> the hot springs mud and sold it for a spa. Um, I would almost think that Ray Skoglund would have with his enterprising ways, but I don't know. I don't so know. So then analyze the mud itself for... I'm itself. not really sure whether it has or not. It could very well be, and I certainly do not <laughs> claim to know everything about what has happened at the hot springs. And for this, uh, along that line, with the lithium, is that what you put in your cell phones, or is that what people take? <laughs> lithium seems to be a drug. Do you know anything about the lithium? Gordon, can you help me? <laughs> we have Gordon Green. So the question is about lithium. I, I missed the whole lithium discussion. Oh, so we have the highest lithium. Oh, I'll go back to the slide. So um, we have we have um, a slide from 1950 showing the mineral content in the water. Oh. That's a nice movie. And it shows the parts per million. Um, and the Geological Survey of Canada has yeah. this. It's not actually in this one because they didn't find very much lithium. Um, they note that there was no appreciable amount of lithium, but then every survey since has always noted that there's about 10 parts per million of lithium. And that's been the claim, that that is the curative or the properties of the hot springs for r things like rheumatoid arthritis. And you have to remember that, um, especially during the first phase of development, their modern medicine wasn't easily accessible, so people were coming to heal themselves. And, um, yeah, and people have always claimed that it's lithium that is responsible for the miracles that have been witnessed there. Do you want to speak to that, Gordon? Yeah, no, okay. I Norma? <laughs> it's a metal. Okay. It's a metal. Too much will kill you when it is a metal, okay. It's <laughs> highly cumulative. Okay. Which means that if you ingest lots of it, it just builds up in your body. And they so do let you drink the hot springs you. water at the hot springs, so. <laughs> Diana, did you have a question? Yeah, I wonder, Marilyn, do you remember micro that article in the Star Weekly? I think it was probably 64. There used to be a um, publication called the Star Weekly, yes. and and there was um, a big article in it, and some lady. I used to live at the airport yeah. in the old days, and there were some ladies from the airport getting this stuff, but, and it was pictures of cool. people that we knew. It was quite a spread, and of course, it was Ripples I think I have the text from that article, but I don't remember the full. There were pictures. There were photos. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I can email you the text from the article if you want to blast from the past. Oh, I do yeah. have that. I've got it all typed yeah. up, but I'm not sure about the pictures. They're probably accessible in the library's newspaper database. You can yeah. probably search it. That was that was that was early '60s, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? So, Kelsey, on behalf of UNBC and Terrace Campus, mm -hmm. I always have to add the Terrace Campus. <laughs> yeah. It's important to be here. Um, I'd like to thank you for presenting the hot springs. It's Thanks, great. Ed. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. <laughs> and thank you to everybody for coming, especially Marilyn, who's provided the majority of these photos. So, I owe her a lot. <laughs>